Coming up next on The Jeff Crilly Show, you're going to meet a survivor of domestic violence. She's going to teach us all how to transcend tragedy. Her incredible journey just ahead. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is the Jeff Crilly Show. So domestic violence is much more common than any of us know. We see police reports and we hear stats, but I think that just speaks for a fraction of the domestic violence cases that are out there because sometimes the victim or survivor is never coming forward with their story. Somebody who knows something about that, Stephanie J. Bond, Transcending Tragedy. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I mean, I believe that the message of a survivor's journey is so important. And so I'm truly honored to be here to, to speak about this societal problem that we have and hopefully help other women that might be struggling. Sure. And we're going to have much more on Stephanie's story in a minute, but I want to talk about the pandemic because if you think about that, you had sometimes uh, people who were quarantined mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen in terms of the number of domestic violence survivors who are coming forward uh, post-pandemic? Well, I think the, the data of, of what uh, a problem this was during the pandemic speaks for itself. Um, people were stuck at home. They were stuck at home with their abusers. They didn't have a way out because nobody was, nobody was out and about, right? So there was no escape. And then you had financial burdens. You had the stress of raising children, of not knowing um, what tomorrow is going to bring. It just created all of those stressors that naturally take place in the home to escalate. And so it was a real, real problem during the pandemic. Sure. So as people are starting to get, you know, have they, have they moved, as they've moved back into their normal life, you know, um, hopefully that they, they can reach out to get to the resources that are there to help them. Sure. Some takeaways from Stephanie in a minute, but I want you to hear her story. He shot me three times with, um, a 45 caliber, and then put the gun in his mouth and killed himself. Our then six-year-old daughter ran down the hallway, found my cell phone, stepped over her father's body, and brought me the cell phone to call 911. It's been eight years since Stephanie Bond was rushed to a hospital near her home in Illinois, fighting for her life. I had one-third of my blood left in my body when I went into surgery. She says physically recovery was tough, but mentally it was worse. It's continually hard for me to come to grips with the fact that the man that I thought I would share the rest of my life with, the man that I had four children with, that I was with, married to for nearly 22 years, tried to murder me. He had been suffering from some serious mental health issues, mainly anxiety, depression, and some personality disorders. And it had gotten to a point where something was going to break. You know, one out of five Americans have a mental health problem and depression is the world's largest disability cause. Lee Richardson is the founder and clinical director of the Brain Performance Center. She says watching the surroundings and behavior of the person is key. Has her medication changed? Has her sleep cycle changed? What about their nutrition? Are they going days without eating anything? How are they interacting with their friends? Are they socially withdrawing? How, are, how is their world changing? While it may seem hard to do in the moment, Stephanie says, after the fact, sometimes you just need to push forward. You constantly question, what could you have done differently? Should you have done differently? Should I have left the marriage earlier? Should I have stayed? And at some point you have to have peace with, you, I did the best I could in the situation at that time. If you feel that something is dangerous, there is something, there's some pivotal shift 
that sixth sense, that instinct to pay attention to it. Ask for help. If you're a very spiritual person, go to your church. Ask your pastor for help. If you're a very cognitive person, go to a counselor. Go to, you know, there's mentalhealthamerica.net. With our children, try to help them understand what the impact is going to be. Sit down with your, your children or your family and say, so how do you feel about that? And then listen. Stephanie says at the end of the day, patience and self-love is one of the most important lessons she's learned. I didn't cause it. I didn't do it. Um, this isn't about me, that kind of thing. So whatever affirmations, just tell yourself that all the time. At one point, I knew that I had to set an example for my kids. My right. advice would be you have to give yourself grace. Stephanie says to try to talk to the therapist who's speaking with your loved one as well so they can see your perspective of what's going on inside of the home. Lee says to know that you're not alone and talking about mental health is okay. To find out more information, you can visit her website, thebrainperformancecenter.com. For Real News, I'm Sarah Strackhouse. Oh, it's been several years since you did that, and yes. you, I was watching you watch it, and you, you still get emotional just hearing it again, don't you? You know, I think you get in the habit of sharing your story in an almost mechanical way, and then every once in a while, you get, I get overwhelmed with the emotion that this was my life, and it still can be somewhat shocking. Even though it has become our family's normal, it's, there's always this out of, out of mind, out of body experience where this was horrific, right? And um, the fact that I survived and that our family is thriving now is a miracle, mm. is, a, is a miracle. And so I think one of the reasons I'm so passionate about sharing my story is over and over and over again, when I talk to people, there's the assumption that domestic violence happens to those people over there. It's not in my own backyard. And yet, if statistically it's one in four, and in Texas it's one in three, um, we all know four women, right? And 20, one of those, or one in three, is going to be suffering from this, and usually in silence. And so I'm a big believer that representation matters. Um, when women are more transparent about their journey, about their story, then we will meet more survivors. It's so hard for me to see women who have struggled with this problem in their own, in their own home. They've struggled privately, and they live with this shroud of self-blame, what could I have done differently? Um, this shroud of embarrassment. I didn't pull the trigger. I didn't cause this. And um, so I would be, I want to see other women be more confident and lean into the successes they have in life, knowing that they're a survivor. Yes. So yeah, representation matters is a big message that I have for other women. Um, I think another thing that is so important for women who have overcome abuse is to realize that being a survivor is a superpower. Um, it, it really is. There's so many things that when you're in an abusive relationship, when you're living within an abusive home, you have to compartmentalize. You have to, you're always being strategic to make to make sure you're safe, your children are safe, to keep everything together. And when that element is no longer a part of your life, you're free to, um, to be your best self, but you've got to lean into it. It is a process, but I think if you can recognize that, again, being a survivor is your superpower, you can be amazing in so many different ways. You're so strong and I know you inspire so many people. And one of the reasons why you are uh, so relatable is you put out these great TikTok videos. Um, here's a recent one. Well, that is the million dollar question now, isn't it? And I've put a lot of thought into this question actually. And I've come up with three very logical reasons as to why my husband killed himself and why he tried to take me out before he did the deed. The first is the sheer fact that he was on a lot of antipsychotic, antidepressants. He had struggled with anxiety, depression, and really had some mental health concerns for the last eight years of our marriage. Um, 
At the time of his death, he was on Abilify, Lamactyl, Clonopin, Cymbalta, and Lexapro, all at the same time, and was drinking on top of that. Truth be told, he was in worse shape at the time of his death than he was when he started seeing this therapist because she had him cycled on so many drugs over the eight and a half years. I mean, you name a drug, he was on it at one point in time. The second reason I believe as to why he hurt me was the sheer fact that I think he was, he was somewhat of a coward. And I don't mean to be disrespectful by saying that. He had been suicidal for years and he'd had several attempts and he never was able to carry it out. Not that I wanted him to, but it just is what it is. I think he had to do something so heinous, so egregious that he had no choice. And by shooting me, trying to kill me, he was not going to go to jail for the rest of his life. So if he took me out, he had to take himself out. And thirdly, he had lots of skeletons in the closet, things that I know he never wanted me to discover, things I eventually did. And I know I never even found out everything, which is okay. Um, probably the most serious was how dire our financial situation was. Um, lots of unexpected surprises. Wow. Stephanie, did it take you a while to have the courage to share your story with the world? Parts of it, absolutely. Um, we lived in Champaign, Illinois, and we were a known quantity because of our children. We had four children in four travel sports. We were business owners. I also worked outside of the home. And Champaign is a small college town. So the shooting took place at four o'clock and we were on the five o'clock news. So there wasn't, I did not have the luxury of being private about our story. So I think that probably helped me be a lot more transparent early on. But as I started to put together all of the pieces of just how bad things were from the financial situation to, again, a lot of the surprises that were discovered later on, um, there, there are pieces that are still a little, a little rough. Mm -hmm. You know, and I also have children, so I try very hard to be respectful of meeting them as to what they're okay with is as well. Because one thing about domestic violence, it's not just the victim. There's a whole domino effect of his family, my family. Um, it affects so many people, you know, that are, the, the trauma is residual with, with everyone, right? Sure. So um, my motivation is to help other people. Uh, my motivation is so that other women going through it realize they aren't alone. I moved to Dallas 11 years ago, and in every corporate position I've had since moving here, I've had a woman say, this happened to me too, but don't tell anyone. I can assure you that I was least likely to be voted the one to be shot by her husband in high school, right? So nobody looks at me as the poster child for domestic abuse. And I think there's a message in that as well, that again, we can, as women, as survivors can lean on one another. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors and we should be there to lift one another up and to realize there is a community of survivors out there. Yes. Well, thank God that you're sharing your story because I you. know you're touching so many people and you're working on a book. We've got some pictures of you off of Facebook. Uh, just you're very involved. You're always out there. You're speaking. Uh, what's the reaction that you get after a speech? Uh, women, men coming up to you? Well, people, when I tell people about the shooting, there's usually a gasp that hits the audience because, yes, they know I'm talking about domestic violence. I think maybe they expect that to be my, my day job is that I'm an advocate, not knowing, not realizing that I am actually a survivor and not just of a, a minor infraction, a pretty big infraction that almost cost me my life. Um, so yes, I'm very involved with Genesis here in the Dallas area. Um, and I've been involved with them for a number of years. They do great work and have so many resources available to help women. 
Um, I'm also involved with an organization called 24 Hour Dallas. Part of their mission is to make the nighttime economy safe for everyone, which includes women. So women's safety is, is a big part of their platform. Um, yeah, I, you know, you, back to your original question, most people don't think that I would be somebody to have gone through that ha, would have gone through something so horrific. Mm. So, Stephanie, we only have about a minute left. Mm -hmm. What are some final thoughts? What do you want to leave people with? Don't be ashamed of your story. If you're a survivor, do not live with this cloud of of um, embarrassment. You didn't cause it. You didn't do it. Lean into your story, lean into your power. You know, one of the things I like to tell people is um, success is not only defined by what you've achieved, but also by how far you've overcome, what you've overcome. So if we're all starting at this one space and we get to here, if you have something like domestic violence in your background, you're back here, you've come so much further. If you own your truth, you'll realize how impactful you truly can be. Mm. What a powerful way to end this segment. We're also going to leave you with her website, which is stephaniejbond.com. Stephanie, thank you so much for thank sharing you. your story. Thank you. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.